Hello everyone. Welcome to McNally Jackson. I'm Michelle, the events coordinator. And first of all, also I need to apologize and say that Mark Crispin Miller is unfortunately sick this evening, so he can't be here um, to moderate the event, but he will be back uh, next year when we continue this series. But tonight we're incredibly honored to have Christian Parenti here, whose latest book is Tropic of Chaos. He's a contributing editor at The Nation, a Puffin Foundation writing fellow at The Nation Institute, and a visiting scholar at the City University of New York. He has a PhD in sociology from the London School of Economics and is the author of several books, including Lockdown America, The Soft Cage, and The Freedom. He, and he's written for numerous publications and has held, held fellowships from the Open Society Institute, Rockefeller Brother Fund, and the Ford Foundation, and has won numerous awards, including Best Magazine Writing 2008 from the Society for Professional Journalists. So let's all welcome Christian Parenti. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. So, and thank you for coming out uh, this evening. So, this book is based on uh, several years of travel, and uh, the argument is essentially that climate change doesn't just look like extreme weather, like snow fall in October, it doesn't just look like drought and uh, freak storms. It also looks like religious warfare, ethnic warfare, counterinsurgency, banditry. That already climate change is having an impact around the world in a way that is exacerbating violence. This is happening most clearly in the global south, but it's also happening in the global north in a very different way. So in many ways, the idea for the book came to me when I was reporting in Afghanistan about the poppy trade, among other things. And I did a series of, uh, I was in and out of Afghanistan numerous times and did a series of stories over a couple of years on poppy. And always part of the explanation that farmers gave for why they grew the crop from which comes opium and then heroin was that, among other things, it was very drought resistant. And at the time, I didn't even realize there was a drought in Afghanistan. Turns out Afghanistan is suffering the worst drought in living memory, which has, by total chance, coincided with the NATO occupation and nation-building project there. Uh, so in this war, one side, the Karzai government, such as it is with its minimal capacity, uh, and the NATO forces led by the U.S., seek to eradicate poppy and they they have at least on paper campaigns of eradicating poppy a lot of times corruption prevents that from happening which is probably a good thing um and the other side of the war the taliban support the farmer's right to grow poppy there's some confusion about that because for one year the taliban banned growing poppy but as a government the the taliban supported the growth uh, the, the cultivation of poppy and as an insurgent movement, they have supported it. It was just the last year in government in exchange for money, drug eradication money. They already had huge stockpiles of poppy, they said. It was also sort of a price control mechanism. They said, no poppy this year. But they've always supported poppy. So the farmers who you know, are stuck in the middle of this war, uh, it, it occurred to me when, when thinking about this, you know, that they're, they're taking these considerable risks to grow poppy in large part because of it's, it's drought resistant and there's this drought. In fact, it turns out that poppy uses one sixth the amount of water that wheat uses. So what that means is essentially, it's the only crop under these climatological conditions that a farmer can make any money on. And there's one side in the war that will defend their right to grow the only crop that under these conditions you can make money on. And the other side in the war is attacking their right to grow this crop. So along with all the ethnic and religious motivations that a farmer might have for joining the Taliban, it occurred to me that there was this other economic motivation rooted in this climate crisis, which was this drought, the worst drought in living memory, and the fact that the Taliban defend the only way they can adapt. So that's not to say that the war in Afghanistan is driven by the drought or driven by poppy or caused by it, but just to say that it is a contributing factor that is not unimportant. So that even in that war, there was a climatological aspect that could be pulled out of it. So I've set out to, to find more examples of that, and lo and behold, there are lots of them. The book opens in the Horn of Africa um, in uh, 
not far from the Somali border in northwest Kenya and um, closer to the Sudanese and Ugandan border, um, where a cattle raid has just occurred. And there's a man lying dead at my feet. His name was Ekeru Lorman. He was a pastoralist. And he had been killed in this cattle raid when the neighboring tribe, the Pakot, came down out of these hills, these mountains called the Karasuk Hills, and tried to steal his and his uh, people's cattle, and they fought them off. And so I asked, why did this guy Ekeru Lorman die? And there's, you know, the answer is layered. At one level, you know, he was killed by a neighbor who wanted his cattle. And cattle raiding in that part of the world is an old and venerable tradition. But it has become more intense in recent decades for a number of reasons. One of them is that, as in Afghanistan, there's a very bad drought there that is, um, in, in, in a way you could say it's a series of droughts. The pattern of drought in the Horn of Africa has just sort of sped up. And so droughts come not once every 10 years or every seven years, but they're coming like every two or three years, every other year. And in Northwest Kenya, it's just been solid drought for numerous years, punctuated only by freak flooding. And actually the precipitation over the last 30 years, the overall precipitation in Kenya has increased, but more and more of the country is experiencing drought because the rainfall comes at the wrong time. It comes suddenly all at once. So the effect is that the land is desiccated. The plants, uh, you know, the land can't hold the water because it comes down too quickly. It, it pushes away topsoil. So the trees are dying and the browse for the cattle is drying up. So pushed by this drought, people are increasing their rating, their cattle rating. And they're literally fighting over water holes and trying to replenish their herds, which are dying due to lack of fodder, trying to replenish their herds by stealing from other people. But there are other layers to, to this, too. It's not just the drought. I mean, what are they using to raid each other? Well, they're using not spears, the traditional weapons, not simple hunting rifles, but machine guns. Lots and lots of cheap machine guns and even more powerful um, not just AK-47s, but if they want grenades and stuff like that, the most herders just carry AK-47s. So why is the region flooded in cheap weaponry? Why do people who, like Ekru Lorman, own only a pair of sandals, other than their animals, they basically own a pair of sandals and you know a, a few articles of clothing, yet they have a machine gun that would cost you know hundreds or thousands of dollars, depending on which market you bought it in, and they are fairly cheap. The answer is basically that the Cold War left the region flooded with weapons. And so again and again, you find this pattern throughout the South. I'll lay out this kind of set of causalities. And you, it, it repeats not only in Kenya, but other places. So the story of the Cold War there is that basically Somalia and Ethiopia engage in a war beginning in the late 70s. And the U.S. and Saudi Arabia and Pakistan support Somalia, Cuba and Soviet Union support Ethiopia, and um, not, uh, you know, against the best intentions of all involved, that ends with Somalia collapsing. And that was not the goal of anyone who was, it was not the goal of Fidel Castro, who sort of begins the, the Cuban and drags the Soviets into Africa, begins that whole relationship, nor was it the goal of Jimmy Carter, who then comes to the aid of Saeed Bari, the Somali dictator. But the end result is that Somalia fights until it collapses, and it hasn't had a functioning state since, and so the entire Horn of Africa is flooded with weapons. And there's been other civil wars that have been fueled by that, and then in turn hemorrhaged weapons into the region. So then why, in the face of this drought, do people like Ekru Lorman fall back on the gun. Why don't they go to the state for help? Why can't, why isn't the government out there building, a, drilling a new water hole if these two peoples are fighting over this one water hole? Why aren't there uh, veterinary extension programs to help rebuild the herds, bring in camels if there isn't enough water for goats? The answer to that is that basically the state throughout the global south has been stripped of its capacities by two to three decades of neoliberal economic restructuring promulgated by the World Bank and IMF. And so in Kenya, the state just doesn't have the capacity. In the name of free, radical free market economics, it has pulled back all of the old sort of sorts of state supports it once had for small farmers and pastoralists like Ekru Lorman. So there's really no public infrastructure for them to fall back on. There are no work programs. There are no help 
to, to heal their animals, to replace their animals, to uh, harvest and manage water better, or to drill for water. And so all they have are the weapons left over from the Cold War, and they seek to adapt to climate change by stealing from their neighbors. So this combination of climate change arriving in a, uh, on a stage in the Global South preset for crisis by the, the, the militarism of the Cold War and the economic ravages of neoliberalism, I call this combination the catastrophic convergence. And you see it again and again and again throughout the Global South. And it's different in different places. In Afghanistan, neoliberal economic restructuring doesn't really play much of a role. There's never really been a structural adjustment program and austerity in Afghanistan. Afghanistan was destroyed by Cold War militarism. The U.S. Su supporting the Mujahideen, the Soviet Union supporting the Afghan government, and this leading to the collapse of the, um, of the Afghan government, and then the civil war between the um, Mujahideen factions. In other places like Mexico, for example, Cold War militarism doesn't play that big uh, a role in explaining the crisis in northern Mexico. But neoliberal economic restructuring plays a huge part. And then now climate change is kicking in and exacerbating that crisis. And I went as part of this book to Juarez looking for climate refugees, which is very easy to find. You start interviewing people, ask them why they've left their land, why they've left their coastal village or whatever. And again and again, stories of extreme weather come up. And um, they then find themselves in Juarez looking for industrial jobs that are not there, up against a militarized border that we won't let them into the U.S., finding that one of the only ways they can make a living is getting to get involved in the drug trade. But an example of how this catastrophic convergence works in a more industrialized country would be Kyrgyzstan. S Central Asian country, north of Afghanistan, not very important for Americans, you know, I mean, it's important uh, to people who live in Kyrgyzstan, important to the region, but people might remember that about a year and a half ago, Kyrgyzstan fell into a kind of paroxysm of ethnic violence, and the reporting was just sort of that Uzbeks and Kyrgyz are at each other's throats again, and they've done this occasionally in the past. But the deeper story is this, Kyrgyzstan gets 90% of its electricity from a hydroelectric dam built by the Soviets, the Toktalik Dam. The same drought that has punished Afghanistan brought the water levels in the Toktalik Dam to their lowest levels ever recorded in 2005. In response to that, the government started rationing electrical power. Once it started rationing electrical power, industry had to start laying people off because there wasn't enough power to run uh, factories and workshops around the clock. Once industry starts laying people off, unemployment goes up. Unemployment goes up, there's less demand, so then other industries have to lay people off, and you get this vicious cycle. On top of that, the government then decides to re-engage a privatization program that had stalled out. It had begun with the collapse of the Soviet Union and then stalled out due in part to popular opposition, and then after about five or six years of, of this stalling out, they're going to try and reinitiate the process of privatization and the first asset they were going to put up for sale was the electrical utility to make that asset more attractive they double power tariffs with a promise to double it again then on top of that comes one of the worst winters ever recorded just this sudden horrible freakishly cold winter cattle herds just drop dead frozen on the hillsides pipes and apartment buildings are bursting pensioners are starving to death so on top of this, you know, power rationing, unemployment, rising, rise utility, uh, uh, steeper utility prices, there's now this tremendous need for power. They don't have it, et cetera, et cetera. So out of this winter, uh, people exit this winter and they hit the streets protesting the economic crisis, the unemployment, the high prices, their desperation. This protest that's about economic issues quickly devolves into an ethnic clashes between young gr groups of young, unemployed, lumpenized Uzbek and Kyrgyz young men who, for lack of education and lack of jobs due to the, the embrace of free market economics and the austerity, spend their time in casinos, drinking vodka and hanging out, getting into sort of you know criminal activity. So this kind of lumpenized vanguard turns this economic protest into ethnic clashes. 
And lo and behold, before long, there are pogroms underway. Uzbek against Kyrgyz, Kyrgyz against Uzbek. This time it was actually mostly Kyrgyz had the upper hand and the Uzbeks fled to the Uzbekistan border and the, Uzbek, the Uzbekistan army blocked them and one government fell and the new Kyrgyz government um, called for Russian intervention. The Russians wisely didn't intervene. The thing is, you know, calm down for the moment. But you see that underneath this ethnic conflict is an economic crisis and underneath that economic crisis is an environmental crisis. The drought, the extreme winter and its effect on the power that the entire economy needs. So this is sort of the, the, the methodology I use to unpack conflicts, looking at the relationship between Pakistan and India, conflict within India. There's you know guerrilla war that's been going on for 30 years in India, the Naxalites, and they have um, moved out of the area where they began in West Bengal, which is like the northeast of India, down the eastern shore, um, the eastern mountain range, the eastern Ghats, it's called, along the kind of coastal plain of India. And they follow drought. And drought has been increasing over the last 10 or 15 years as the Naxalites have, have progressed. And the way that the Naxalites follow drought is that they are um, responding to an economic crisis that is about not just drought, but neoliberalism. Since 1991, the Indian government has been liberalizing the economy. This has been associated with high rates of growth and the birth of a billionaire class in India, but also rising inequality and in the countryside, real immiseration for people. And neoliberalism is sometimes associated with high rates of growth, um, often associated with very low rates of growth, growth, as it was in Latin America, but always associated with increased inequality. And that is very destabilizing because sociologists have long known that inequality provokes violence in a way uh, more so than just absolute suffering. That people are ready to commit crime or to rebel or uh, fight a religious war if they experience their deprivation relative to what was, what could be, what others have. This is called relative deprivation. So there's definitely this increased inequality is felt on the ground. So radical free market economics in India has meant that the state has withdrawn its, its traditional sort of semi-socialist supports for small farmers. They can't get credit as easily from subsidized banks. They can't get other forms of support such as um, government uh, assistance in drilling wells. So as the drought, as they face the drought, they have to turn to private money lenders. The private money lenders and where I was doing my research was in northern Andhra Pradesh. The private moneylenders will only loan money to farmers who are going to grow cotton. And the reason for this is that if they grow some other crop that's edible, like a grain, like um, barley or jawar, there's the risk that the farmers facing a crisis could steal the collateral, i.e. eat the crop. But if the farmers grow this inedible crop, cotton, they have no choice but to sell it. So the money lender will get their money. And the money lenders don't want land as collateral because that's how bad the economic crisis is. And also the, and the environmental crisis. They just don't want the land. It's being stripped by this GMO cotton. So in the face of this drought, farmers go into debt. They have to plant cotton. They use genetically modified cotton. They put more and more chemicals on this cotton. They, the more cotton they produce, the lower the price of cotton. And the cycle goes on and on and on. And at the point of, of losing their land, many farmers actually commit suicide. And in Andhra Pradesh, 2,000 farmers or more than 2,000 farmers have committed suicide. Across India, it's about 200,000 farmers faced with debt have committed suicide. Like and drinking the pesticide. Yeah, yeah. In this like horrifically kind of poetic comment on, on the thing, they drink the pesticides for the cotton. But they also sometimes commit political homicide. And the Naxalites come into these drought-affected areas where farmers are, you know, deeper and deeper in debt, and they say to them, you know, we have a solution for you. We have a long-term and a short-term solution. The short-term solution is when the moneylender shows up next, we stop his car and we pull him out and we kill him. And the long-term solution is you join us and we fight this revolution and we have socialist, Maoist socialist utopia in India, which may or may not you know, play out. But definitely the short-term solution, imagine if you're on the verge of committing suicide by drinking pesticide, that's pretty appealing. And so uh, the, the Naxalites have moved with drought in this fashion. And the state's response has not been to uh, back down from 
their embrace of neoliberalism and to re-extend state supports to poor farmers, but rather to establish new and, and more ruthless and better trained paramilitary police squads. They're called, in under Pradesh, they're called the Greyhounds, and they travel around keeping villagers under surveillance, registering people, trying to find out who are Naxalite informants, and they, you know, kill them. And the Naxalites try and kill them in, in turn, and there are occasional firefights and lots of assassinations. North of Andhra Pradesh, just across the border from where I was in Chhattisgarh, where the issue is less about drought and actually more about mining, they're setting up paramilitary squads called the Salvajudam, who at the, in the moment right now are under the control of the state and are helping the state fight the guerrillas, but they're really just uh, gangsters, you know, who the state has given guns to. And there's absolutely no guarantee that these guys will do what the state wants, that they will give up their guns someday. And so the state is seeding the landscape with more guns, more men trained in assassination, interrogation, and small unit combat destabilizing the situation even further in response to the war. So I could go on and on and on with examples like this, but... Did you say 200,000 suicides? 200,000 suicides, yeah. Nationwide. Um, so that's kind of like a sketch of how climate change is breeding violence in the global south. And I discuss the situation in Brazil and parts of Africa and, and, and Asia. But in the global north, there's also already climate violence, I would argue, but it looks very differently. Here, it looks like increased border militarization and an increased embrace of an open-ended global-scale project of counterterrorism and counterinsurgency. So you see it clearly on the border with Mexico, where there has been you know, a buildup in, in um, border fortifications and the number of border patrol agents and the kinds of weapons they have going since the early 90s. But increasingly, this militarization of the border is discussed in explicitly environmental terms. There is an element of the anti-immigrant uh, political scene that describes the crisis in environmental terms. They sort of say, yes, there's an environmental crisis, there's not enough to go around, and so the solution is to throw up walls and exclude immigrants, and also for uh, citizens of this country to surrender their civil liberties and allow the police to search wherever and whenever they want in the name of deporting undocumented immigrants. And at any given night, you know, there are 30,000 people in a largely privatized jail system housing undocumented immigrants who haven't committed crimes, who aren't charged with criminal crimes, but who've just violated immigration laws. And uh, the U.S. prison system is by and large not privatized. You know, there's very few private beds actually in the American prison system. But in the immigration detention system, that's where private operators are really ha have... Um, a lot of beds. And the oversight and the standards in this prison system of 30,000 undocumented immigrants is minimal and the abuses are rife. So that's a form of violence that is not reducible to climate change, but it is in part driven by it. Um, you know, the people are leaving the land in Latin America in part because of the extreme weather. And it's become so routine now we don't even hear about it. Like there has just been horrendous flooding in El Salvador. There's been a state of emergency declared in El Salvador. It's last week. Um, and, you know, I was, uh, I was mentioning to a colleague in front of mine about Bangkok. And, I mean, I think some people are not aware that much of Bangkok is underwater. So throughout the global south, these crises are becoming sort of so normal that they're not even front page news anymore. Um, the other way in which the North is kind of responding and increasing the role of violence in politics and becoming more violent in response to climate change is this embrace of open-ended counterinsurgency and counterterrorism. It's counterinsurgency sometimes, sometimes it's this new special operations-oriented counterterrorism. But here's an example, which is actually not in the book because it happened sort of after the book was put to bed. I stopped writing this in February. But the Arab Spring, um, to use the, the term of art, in many ways involves, you know, very positive progressive things. Uh, you know, people mobilizing to overthrow kleptocratic, kleptocratic dictatorships. But it has also led to three wars. Libya, uh, I mean, there's basically civil wars resumed in Yemen. 
something like civil war in Syria, though it seems like one side has all the guns. So how did that happen? And, and the response to this from the U.S. is to increase, you know, its I mean, well, direct military intervention in Libya, increased deployment of special forces and drones in Yemen and throughout the region. What's the climate angle to that? Well, the uh, from 2010 to 2000, June 2010 to June 2011, the price of wheat and corn both spiked dramatically. Wheat went up, I believe, 83%, corn 91%. Part of the reason for that is one of the worst droughts ever recorded in the Black Sea region. It's called the Black Sea drought. It's the worst drought in 100 years. It caused Russia to stop exporting grain. It hit Kazakhstan, Russia, and Ukraine, always in the top grain exporters, hit them very, very badly. Russia stopped exporting grain also at the urging of Glencore, which is, along with Cargill, always sort of the number one or number two commodities trading firm in the world. And it's actually run by and was started by Mark Rich. who It's a name that might be familiar to you guys from the 90s. Yeah, fugitive from U.S. justice. So what? They call him the Tin Man. The Tin Man? So Glencore openly calls on Russia to, to stop exporting grain, which Russia does. Grain prices spike. Glencore has this fabulously profitable uh, public stock offering. Who is the largest grain importer in the world? Egypt. And other countries in the Maghreb are also uh, heavy grain importers. The last thing that Ben Ali did when he fled Tunisia was promise to lower the price of food. And those early protests, one of the demands was about the price of food. In Egypt, in between 2010 and 2011, Food inflation was running at 20% a year. In Egypt, uh, the average family spends 40% of their income on food. So again, it's not to say that the whole thing is about climate change, but that when we wonder why was it this year, why wasn't it two years ago, why wasn't it five years from now, part of it has to do with the fact that this was the second price spike in food in about five years. And it was not just that drought in Russia, but also flooding in the Midwest and Canada, flooding and drought in Australia. All of this put pressure on grain prices. And that played out directly as suffering in the streets of the Maghreb. And that, I think, had a contributing factor to what tipped the scales this time around. And so that has led to increased instability. And the response to that in the US is not to discuss any of these underlying economic causes or climatological causes, but to basically have yet further impetus for deploying more and more drones, more and more special forces, sending more and more advisors. And, and we see under Obama, as he's withdrawing from Iraq and drawing down in Afghanistan, there's this clearly this, this doctrine of open-ended global counterterrorism, counterinsurgency as a management strategy for a planet in crisis. So that's not reducible to climate change, but increasing, and it doesn't appear like these are climate wars, but that is one of the driving causes behind many of the conflicts to which the U.S. is intervening and will be intervening in the coming years. So that's sort of the argument, um, the problem laid out. And in, in the end, I you know offer some suggestions as to what can be done. I mean, part of thinking about this catastrophic convergence between uh, of uh, militarism, neoliberalism, and climate change suggests that adaptation requires undoing those pre-existing problems, that we have to really think about militarism, the unintended consequences of it, and about neoliberalism and how absolutely destabilizing and dangerous that is. But that also, beyond questions of adaptation, we have to really take seriously mitigation, which is to say reducing carbon emissions. Because for those of you who are not clear, and I have not I didn't lay this out. Uh, climate science is, is pretty certain that there are tipping points in the climate system, that the causes build up, but the effects lag, and that if we wait too long to respond to the effects, it might be too late and they'll kick in all at once. So Jim Hansen, NASA's main climate scientist, believes that once we cross the threshold of 350 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, that's potentially a tipping point after which there are changes in the Earth's climate system that actually make climate change, global warming, make it a self-fueling process. The 
The simplest example of that is the melting of the permafrost in the Arctic, beneath which are trapped huge stores of methane. Methane is a greenhouse gas 20 times more powerful than CO2. If that naturally occurring methane is released into the atmosphere due to the melting of the permafrost, that will accelerate climate change in a way and at a rate that will be very hard for human civilization to deal with. Right now, the main cause of uh, uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere the main the main source of greenhouse gas increase in the atmosphere is burning of fossil fuels by human civilization so it's currently within our grasp to change this but before much longer our burning of fossil fuels might be secondary to nature's release of greenhouse gases like methane so it's imperative that we act quickly and there are things that can be done uh, immediately to do that. And I don't get into too much detail, but just in the interest of sort of not uh, bumming out my readers too much, I look at some things that can, be, that can be done in the United States right now without lining up any new votes, without getting the Republican Party, which doesn't believe in science, it seems, to go along with it. So the main things are the government... Um, plays an enormous role in the U.S. economy. This is a talking point that is misrepresented by the right uh, to claim that we have some sort of socialist dictatorship here. And then many leftists and liberals shy away from looking at these facts. And the fact of the matter is that the, the government sector is quite large in this country. The federal government and state government combined, but uh, excluding overlap, constituted in 2008 38% of the U.S. GDP. Now that was a year of intense economic crisis and contraction and there was state expansion so that's kind of a high number. But in better years the government sector is about you know 33 to 35% of gross national product. That is potentially a, a tremendous tool for shifting our economy away from burning fossil fuels towards clean energy. The federal government owns uh, the largest single fleet of buildings in the economy. It's the single largest consumer of power in the economy. A lot of that's for the military, but even excluding that, it consumes enormous amounts of power. It has various vehicle fleets. The post office, for example, has a fleet of about 160,000 vehicles that on average travel 18 miles a day and park in the same place every night. They could be electrified very, very easily. If if the post office electrified and the um, the government uh, services agency, which is sort of like the janitor to the federal government, and all of these state institutions electrified what, what, what fleets they could, that would mean that the price of electric vehicles and of batteries would come down to the point where they would be competitive with gasoline and diesel-powered vehicles. Once buying an electric truck is cheaper than buying a diesel truck, then the private sector will more likely than not be willing to embrace it. And along with a little pushing, then they'll, they'll, they will at least won't resist it. And you can get a switch, uh, and close the price gap between clean technology and dirty technology. And there's you know endless other examples of retrofitting buildings, all sorts of ways in which the government's uh, infrastructure can be used to build markets for the existing technology that's out there, which is currently suffering because it doesn't have markets. And you have this example of Solyndra, the solar firm that collapsed. I mean, that's a perfect example of how um, cockeyed the uh, Obama policy on green energy has been. They were just shoveling subsidies to this firm that in many ways, more than subsidies, a lot of these clean tech firms, they need markets, you know? They need somebody to buy these things. And that's really what the government should be doing. Uh, the other thing that can be done without passing new legislation or getting the Republicans on board is the Environmental Protection, C Protection Agency is required to regulate greenhouse gases, greenhouse gas emissions. This happened after Clinton signed the Kyoto Protocol and the Senate refused to ratify it Green groups sued and they fought for 10 years and they forced the Supreme Court to rule in their favor that in fact greenhouse gases harm human health and therefore they need to be regulated under the Clean Air Act of 1970. We are currently waiting for about 30 rules to be issued by the EPA about greenhouse gas emissions. If the EPA were to 
promulgate these rules in a robust fashion. That would impose a de facto carbon tax on burning coal and oil and would help shift investment towards clean technology. And if that happened, along with the use of government purchasing, you could have, in a matter of a year or two, real movement in the right direction. So it's not that I think that's going to happen, because we have uh, every indication that that is not uh, what the Obama administration wants to do. They have just issued very bad rules around ground level uh, ozone. And um, they have not move forward with these 30 rules. So they are shying away from the power that they have. But the point is, it's not hopeless, and it doesn't require getting Eric Cantor and John Boehner to suddenly believe in science or any of that. You know, even in this sclerotic, messed up situation we have, there's a lot that could happen that could move us in very concrete, real, meaningful ways towards a solution. And, you know, I also end... Um, with dealing with just one last thing in honor of Bertel Ullman, who's sitting here in the audience, um, I deal with, you know, Marx and Engels come up with the idea of a metabolic rift, that capitalism and nature are fundamentally incompatible, that at the simplest level, the earth is finite, capitalism can potentially grow forever. So right there, that's, that's a, a fundamental incompatibility. I argue to my friends and comrades in the radical uh, left and environmental uh, movement that uh, I urge them to embrace this idea of an emergency short-term solution to think in terms of capitalism possibly being able to deal with the switch from fossil fuels to clean energy. And the reason I think that's important is because of this time frame. There simply isn't enough time to solve all problems and then get to changing how civilization creates energy. That has to happen first. Now, if that happens, that doesn't actually take care of the environmental crisis. Climate change is not the environmental crisis. It's one piece of the environmental crisis, but it's the piece that could trump all others. But if we solve the, the crisis of emitting greenhouse gases, that doesn't mean we have solved the, all of the other crises of deforestation, um, uh, overuse of water, um, the, the exploitation and pollution of the seas. I mean, there's so many remaining inter, interlocked environmental crises that still have to be dealt with and, and still keep on the table this question about whether or not capitalism is compatible with nature. That's a question that's open to debate. And, and the metabolic rift is in many ways very real. But the necessity to address the emergency of where our fuel comes from and getting off of fossil fuels cannot be held hostage to those other larger questions because we simply don't have time to wait for that. This has to happen in the next 10 or 20 years, and that means it's these institutions that have to start dealing with it here and now. So on that note, I will open it up to your questions. Yes. Um, I just remember before I asked my question, uh, Mark Rich was known as the metal man of the tin man. Okay. Because he, cr he helped create the metal um, trading business, commodities. Um, and also, Goldman Sachs played a big role in that wheat and grain uh, shortage because of their speculation mm. after the drought. But here's my question um, Have you ever compared your work to that of Robert Kaplan? Because He's, his stories follow a similar arc to yours, except in the last few years he's fallen on the side of the military industrial complex, where he's saying, we need more special forces, we need more counterterrorism. Look at this threat that's looming. And he mm -hmm. describes the threat in a similar way you do, but he comes to a completely different conclusion. Mm -hmm. And it just shows you that the, the same problem and the same uh, critique of it can come with radically mm -hmm. different proposals. Yeah, I mean, in. I, de I definitely have, and I mean, it's it's it was you know it's frustration with the where he ends his uh, conclusions and and frustration with also his explanation for things. I mean, you know, he does not have a critique of militarism or of neoliberalism. I mean, he has no critique of imperialism uh, to explain why there is this crisis of violence throughout much of the global south. And I think in response to that whole discourse of 
around state failure and civil war and social breakdown in the global south, there's been a kind of silence from the left to some extent. I mean, we like champion the social movements in the global south, but don't really talk about the real crises that exist throughout much of the global south. And that then becomes the terrain for this right wing discourse of humanitarian interventionism, open, open ended counterinsurgency. And I didn't want to, you know, I was frustrated by that, the acknowledgement of this crisis of violence in much of the global south being the terrain only of the right wing. And I wanted to have a progressive critique of it that's more historically rooted and then to, to offer different historical solutions and not just for, for sort of rhetorical or ideological reasons, but because Kaplan is fundamentally wrong. You know, I mean, more violence begets more violence. I mean, you see this and I dis discuss this in detail in the book. Um, counterinsurgency and counterterrorism, uh, but particularly counterinsurgency because the goal of the, the war is the hearts and minds of the people, the social terrain. It, unlike conventional warfare, it attacks social relations in a way that is deeply destabilizing. So in Central America, which were the front lines of American counterinsurgency in the 1980s, 1970s, 1980s, in places like El Salvador, Nicaragua, Honduras, the, uh, the, the, the murder rate is equal to the casualty rate during those wars. But now there's no two sides, there's no cause, there's just this mayhem and violence. The, the landscape is flooded with weapons, the, the society is traumatized, people have been uprooted, deracinated, there are people, you know, groups of men trained in torturing and smuggling and killing, you know, who were guerrillas, they were uh, police officers, now they may be police officers, they may just be gangsters. But, um, you know, that's what counterinsurgency produces. It produces totally traumatized, violent societies. And you see that in Afghanistan. You see it. I mean, I think you will see it in, in Iraq that, that, you know, once the war is over, the place will be, you know, ripped to pieces for years. And so this idea that just pouring more weapons into these crises is going to somehow put the lid on it is, is completely wrong. It will make it worse and worse. And that's like, you know, that's not some sort of bleeding heart, moralistic, like, oh, I'm against war, but it's actually like, no, all right, let's, let's, let's just accept whatever Kaplan, what his uh, stated goals are. It's not going to work. You know, you cannot bomb, torture, uh, and police uh, out of this crisis. There has to be development in social justice. And so, like, I mean, the Kenyan invasion of Somalia, I mean, that's an invitation to bring the Shabaab to Kenya. To bring the 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 fundamentalist guerrilla terrorist forces in Somalia to come bomb Nairobi. That's what that is. I mean, it's insane, even in its own terms. We need a replacement for Al Qaeda, so there we go. <laughs> yes. Across the U.S. political spectrum, where, if anywhere, do you see any political leadership that's you know on the side of trying to do something about the problem to so carefully pointed out? Um, you mean it, among like politicians? Yeah, right. Anywhere? Well, I mean there are there are a few um, there are a few individuals, you know. But I mean, none that are none that um, come to mind leap out. I mean, but there are environmentalists in in Congress and uh, you know around the country. I mean, the governor of Vermont, Pete Shumlin, is trying to do things. I mean, I'm kind of partial to Pete Shumlin. I know him, and I'm voted against him and supported his opponents but when he was being opposed by the progressive party but then have also in the most recent election supported him um but um there are there are individual politicians but you know i don't really focus at, uh, on on that kind of at that level in great detail but there are there are progressive democrats who want to do the right thing but you know they're not getting any support from the administration and there needs to be more uh pressure from you know the grassroots which yeah and luckily there is there's been this campaign around the, the keystone xl pipeline that's had a lot of traction so that would be a tremendous victory that would be that's very important in and of itself because if those tar sands are developed that will just release enormous amounts of co2 into the atmosphere and push us that much further to the brink so it's important in and of itself but it would also be really important to um you know to build momentum for other fights and there are victories uh, underway there's this whole campaign around coal and actually you know mayor bloomberg gave a lot of money to the uh, beyond coal campaign 
And so throughout Appalachia, there are, there's a sort of swarming of movements to, to stop mountaintop removal, shut down coal plants, and running, you know, the, 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 the tactics run from tree sits to lawsuits and mass mobilization and lobbying. And they have successfully gotten, I believe it's over 130 scheduled coal plants have been shut down and they're not going to be built because of this kind of pressure. Pressure like this caused Lisa Jackson, who's head of the EPA, who actually, by all accounts, is she's not doing a great job as head of EPA. She's not. She's doing a bad job, but she's actually not a bad person, and she seems to get these issues and take them seriously. But she's clearly getting pressure from the administration to to not disrupt things. But she did actually rescind one massive um, permit uh, for mountaintop removal. So there have been victories around. Um, you know, and coal. If if we were serious about getting off of fossil fuels, the very first thing we would do would be stop mining coal and stop burning coal, and switch coal plants in the very short term to natural gas, which requires almost no retrofitting, and close those down as fast as possible while uh, embracing radical energy conservation and building up an infrastructure of solar, wind, hydroelectric, tidal kinetics, those kinds of things. But be careful. Where's the gas coming? No, I know, but this is the thing. People, I mean, I'm not advocating. Oh, we burn natural gas. I said, no, no. It's like, but as a bridging fuel, and there's there's shale gas, which is horrible. That's where it comes from fracking. But there's also tons of what's called associated gas, which is associated with petroleum. It comes up with petroleum, which to this day is being burnt. It's being flared off in the Dakotas. It's insane, and it's much it's much cleaner. It's not perfect, but it's cleaner than coal. Just as a bridging fuel. Like if we were serious, that's what you would burn in some coal plants for five or ten years before you shut them all down. Yes. In your talk, you did an excellent job in explaining all the horrors that you laid out uh, in terms of a series of interconnected developments and bringing out the special importance of climate change, which doesn't get that attention, until you came to Obama. And here, what uh, not just he, but his government and most of the Democratic Party are doing is nothing, less than nothing. And that, you say, uh, you seem satisfied. Now, maybe you were rushed to... No, I, how do I seem satisfied? No, no, it's not with what he's not doing. But you seem satisfied, maybe because you were rushed in your, uh, in your conclusion, in not uh, giving us what uh, accounts for that. Everything else, in other words, is accounted for. And here, this extremely intelligent president, uh, and uh, a lot of obviously intelligent people surrounding him, seem to be ignoring this fantastically important problem right. when, as you present, uh, uh, rightly, there are these solutions which could be undertaken with, uh, while retaining some of the basic, maybe most of the basic structures of capitalism. Right. Well, that might suggest that you haven't taken a close enough look to, at capitalism. Uh, that is to say, the, that the kind of changes that you advocate, which sound terribly reasonable to me, are going to make uh, some of the biggest capitalists in the country uh, lose money. Uh, yeah, well, that, yeah. And, and with the loss of money, to lose power and influence. And so they, uh, of course, see that, and they're using a certain chunk of that money to make sure that, that uh, the Siamese twin relationship that has always existed uh, between the big government and big capital uh, continues in force, uh, no matter which party is control uh, of the government. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, maybe you want to take a second look about how this uh, problem uh, that you correctly pose uh, without uh, trivializing it in any way can, despite the possibility that a, an intelligent leaders could, without changing the structure of capitalism, maybe they can't really do anything about because of the way capitalism actually works with who has the well, money and power now and yeah. how this is used to keep them earning it in the... Yeah, okay, that that's, in a way, no offense, that's the easy case to make. The easy case to make is that we have gone over the edge and we have careened off the cliff and that it's impossible to do anything. I mean, that's the easy case to make. And I could, I could explain to you that's why that's hopeless. That's but, so then if we are serious about addressing this problem in the short term, then we are stuck with dealing with the fact that it's going to have to be capitalism. There's going to have to be divisions. And basically, the fossil fuel industry is going to have to be abandoned by the other parts of the capitalist class. Now, why is Obama not doing that? 
I think for reasons that have been documented very well elsewhere, that he is a complete coward politically. He doesn't want to be called uh, anti-business in any way. And those industries have invested enormous amounts of money in organizing and messaging to defend themselves. ExxonMobil, the Koch brothers. I mean, ExxonMobil has again and again been called out. The Royal Society in uh, England, you know, the, in London, uh, in Britain, the sort of top scientific body, has officially asked ExxonMobil to stop funding climate denial. ExxonMobil said they would, and then they keep doing it. And they're like, oh, we're sorry, we didn't realize we were doing that. And the Koch brothers, very famously, and they're, they're fighting tooth and nail to defend this enormous amounts of sunk capital. And they have, you know, taken hold of much of the GOP. And there's no reason for the clean tech sector or other sectors to go uh, up against them. And the Obama administration is, you know, been in hock to the um, utility industry and stuff like that. So, I mean, I have no illusions about what Obama would do, but my point about saying what could happen now is just to get, you know, to, to prevent people from slipping into total despair. Yeah. Well, one last thing, please. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't mention Occupy Wall Street, and I think that has to be mentioned in all such discussions because it has two uh, diametrically opposed uh, effects. One is that it uh, increases the, uh, the thinking of so many people that we can't do anything about climate change now because they think that in the short run uh, it's going to uh, reduce uh, the number of jobs. And if you talk about jobs, 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 then you have to sort of forget about everything else, like the effects of things on climate change, and just do what can supply some, a few more jobs. On the other hand, as this thing grows and begins to take on not just the inequality, but something about the conditions which cause inequality, it creates a slight possibility that what you simply treat as absolutely impossible, which is a change in the capitalist structures, some kinds of socialist trans transformation, may in fact also have received a little push which together forward, which together with the desperate problems coming out of climate change, when pe if and when people realize that the only way to change it will be to actually get rid of capitalism, mm -hmm. that, that becomes not a, a long-term solution, but maybe the only, yeah. only possible short-term solution. I don't think that we're going to overthrow global capitalism in 10 or 20 years, and we do have to deal with cutting emissions in that time frame, or we're really going to be in dire, dire possible, consequences. I would agree with you that we're possible in capitalism. So... Well, I guess we, I, yeah, I just, I don't, I mean, I, I think it has to be possible under capitalism. And I, the example that I use, and that's not, as I said, that's not to say that capitalism reconciles with nature. But, you know, if you look back at the history of capitalism, uh, you know, there's always elements of socialism within it, right? Capitalism is regulated. Capital doesn't have its way always. It's always butting up against popular power embodied in state policy. And one site of those um, struggles has always been about resources and the environment. And all of these things, like clean water uh, in cities and, and stuff like that, are the product of popular power and progressive state power containing and controlling and regulating private wealth. And so the actual history of capitalism is full of examples of local environments being despoiled, there's a crisis, and then there's a solution in the form of regulation. So cities are the perfect example of that. And the disease and the filth of cities have been contained by a modicum of socialism. That didn't overthrow capitalism and that didn't solve the environmental crisis. But it's an example of how capitalism can be forced to, to clean up. Also, the, you know, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Endangered Species Act, these are not to be dismissed as meaningless. I mean, they have had a very real impact on the quality of the environment in this country. And so I do think that there is actually space for a real and meaningful reform of capitalism's damage to the environment in, in the short term. And so that's what I think is realistic. In terms of Occupied Wall Street, you know, I'm, I, can't, I can't deal with everything, you know, Bertel. I mean, is it, we, could, we come up with another list of things I haven't dealt with, some of which I dealt with in other books and others I plan to deal with in future books. Um, so give me time. But in terms of in terms of Occupied Wall Street, yeah, I mean, I'm I am like many people, very heartened 
but you know I'm also uh, wary of the kind of um, I mean I'm I'm unclear as to how this gets institutional traction. I was just at Brooklyn College. We were in one of my classes. We were discussing the sit-down strikes actually today, uh, in in the 30s. You know, and asking my students, well, how how is this similar and how is this different from occupied Wall Street? And obviously, it's similar in many ways. But you know, this is not a GM plant in Flint. This is not uh, costing somebody enormous amounts of money. This is not to poo-poo Wall Street. I don't know where else people would sit down. I'm not saying I have some better plan, but you know, you look at this movement and it's like. How does this translate into change uh, is not clear. And I also think it's a long-term struggle uh, that a lot of what this is about, and I have a piece coming out where I wrote with a friend of mine, Rob Eshelman, we're arguing that, you know, there has to, part of this struggle, if we're going to be realistic about this, is Occupied Wall Street is going to work in the long term, the near long term. It's not going to work in six months before the snows come or like, uh, by changing the Democratic uh, Party's agenda for the next election. This is going to work if there is a reintroduction of class consciousness and class discourse and a shift of the whole political spectrum over the course of a decade or several years. And um, so I'm hopeful, but I'm also, you know, watching and waiting to see how this will play out. And I, I don't have, like I said, a solutions i'm not an organizer i'm not i'm not a, a scholar of social movements and i don't presume to know what is the right thing but um i'm a bit also a bit uh wary of the kind of the kind of moralism that infuses the the extreme horizontalism of occupied wall street the idea i mean many people associated with occupied wall street or some people associated with occupied wall street you know uh, see the, the the process as the victory, you know, and and don't want to sort of instrumentalize it, that this is the revolution, that this democratic decision-making is the goal. And I guess I'm a little more old-fashioned than that. I want to see, you know, institutional power. I want to see uh, the other side making concessions. And how that will happen, I don't know. But Yes, in the back. Communist China and India have almost 40% of the world's population. I understand there's no EPA, there's no OSHA, there's no unions in <coughs> Communist China or India. There's some or unions in China. Area, controlled by the government in both, I think, both countries, my, from what I understand. American corporations, because of this, are, over the last 20 years, millions of jobs, money, capital, technology flowing into these two countries, especially uh, China. Mm -hmm. My question, sir, is if nothing changes in the next 10 or 15 years, <coughs> if nothing changes in America or China or India or, or anywhere else in the world, what do you see? What do you foresee 10 well, years from now, 15 well, years from now? More of, more of what's described in most of the book, which is, you know, Religious war, ethnic war, counterinsurgency, social breakdown, criminality. Um, but, you know, in terms of China, there are unions in China. And actually, the, uh, the All-Chinese Labor uh, Federation, I think it's Federation or Congress, I forget, but, um, which is the big kind of like, you know, state union, even it is actually acting like a trade, a real trade union more and more. I interviewed um, Han Dongfang, who was the kind of like labor representative to Tiananmen Square. And his position now is that basically organized labor in China, that organized workers should basically try and renovate the official union. Uh, and there's a, a tension between local governments and the central government. And local governments are frequently, you know, the ones who send out thugs and kill labor organizers. The central government not necessarily out of any kind of, um, you know, uh, progressive ethics, but just so much out of a kind of rational response to the crisis that, that exists in China of 300 million people living in poverty. The whole thing is kind of falling forward. It's a powder cake, potentially. And they want to see growth and development. And part of that involves 
rising wages for people. And one way to do that is to actually allow workers to have the political space to pressure employers for a higher standard of living. So there's actually some support from the central government for workers to push against these state governments that are, these provincial governments that are in league with the specific firms and to, you know, give, give workers the space to, to broker more rights and more wages. So that's one thing that I'm, you know, hopeful about. And I was surprised when I went and reported on this in, in like 2007 or 2008, I think. But um, another thing that's kind of hopeful about China, and again, it's easy to make the case for how, you know, China is a disaster, the rivers are all polluted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which is all true, you know. There's an environmental crisis in China that's unbelievable. But they're also embracing clean technology very quickly. And again, it's not always for high-minded, globally-oriented reasons. In part, it's because burning coal in China has led to a crisis at the local level, at the municipal level, of air pollution that is so extreme that they have to do something about it. Um, it's, you know, the air quality index here, when it reaches 50, we get a warning. When it reaches 100, you know, we're told to stay inside. Beijing goes weeks at a time in the summer where their air quality index is at 500. I mean, the air is literally unbreathable. It's really shocking when you go there for the first time. And so due to that, they're investing heavily in windmills. They were very wise. They, they invited Gamesa and GE and Vestas, all the big windmill firms in. They, they, they invited them in, and they do what industrializing countries always do. They do what, what the United States did with looms, you know, sent a spy to England, Lowell, who memorized the looms and then set them up in Massachusetts. They invite GE and Gamesa in, and they basically steal the technology. And GE and Gamesa are you know, up in arms about this. And the Chinese have said, well, you can either have 2% of a market that's growing at 20% a year, or you can sue us. You, which one is it? And these firms are by and large going along with the program of like, okay, we'll, we'll just keep quiet. And so they're, you know, they're really embracing clean technology. Will it be enough in time? I mean, probably not, but maybe. They're doing a lot more than, than the US government is. And it's, it's because of these local crises. And I think they're also going to have these advantages internationally, you know, that, that they're going to be selling these, these systems internationally and, and making big money on it. Yes. Um, people say, what is the focus of Occupy Wall Street? They, they seem to have a, like a disordered random meaning, just a meaning to it basically. But there's a money exhibit there that's used as a focus, like a profit aid and concentration, a private coin collection. <coughs> For money around the world that shows what Wall Street took in the global mm -hmm. economy and what they are trying to get back as a symbol, a symbolic mm -hmm. statement, a revolutionary act. It's now on display on the um, Broadway side of. Yeah, I don't think that Wall that I don't think that occupied Wall Street doesn't have any focus. I think that's one of the best things about it. It, it has a very clear focus that it's about the one percent Wall Street. Does it have institutional traction? I mean, it's developing it. That's different than whether or not it has a focus. But anyway, I think maybe. One more question. Maybe we should just wrap it up. Okay. I was told, or I understand, that water is a, has become a critical factor in China. Everywhere. Is that true? Yes. I mean, it's a critical factor everywhere, as this gentleman says. But yes, China uh, has very serious water problems. A lot of the rivers are polluted. There's um, increasing desertification. Uh, it's a serious problem. Very serious problem. Yeah. So, all right. I will uh, sign books for anyone who wants to buy one. And thank you for coming out. Thanks for your questions. <laughs>